<laughs> Hi and welcome to Mission Apollo episode number 20. We lost the count. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in any case, today is a very special occasion. Uh, we have Chris Ray on the podcast, uh, my co founder, uh, obviously, uh, someone who's been with Apollo since day one, since inception. And we, we've discussed our history and, and the early days of Apollo many, many times. But it recently occurred to us that we haven't actually caught up with Chris in the last couple of months to see what he's been up to. And it turns out he's been up to a lot. So <laughs> you probably are watching this because you caught an episode of This Week at Apollo that dropped a few weeks ago, where Chris revealed some, some pretty big updates uh, when it comes to distribution and, uh, and availability of Apollos across uh, America and, and Australia. So if you haven't checked it out, highly recommend you go back to This Week at Apollo with Chris. Um, it's uh, it, it's going to provide you with a lot of context on this episode. And today we wanted to take some time to really dive a little bit deeper into wholesale, the scooter, the electric scooter landscape uh, more broadly and, and globally. Um, sort of understand what trends are you seeing, you know, uh, what, what does it look like in Europe versus in, in America? And uh, most importantly, where do you think all of us as industry players are headed? So can you just give us a bit of a lay of the land in terms of scooter distribution worldwide? Where, where are we at? Yeah, sure. So I think the most, well, again, firstly, thank you for having me on the podcast. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Um, so I think the, the biggest thing is just giving context over electric scooters overall. Um, electric scooters are still a very, very new category. Um, it started with Razer in 1998. Um, and then in 20, 2009 is when the lithium ion battery technology came to, to land. And that started fueling more and more um, you know, electronic devices. And then Xiaomi in 2016 was was the big one, the Xiaomi mm -hmm. M365. Oh, we um, remember. Oh, changing a tire on that is not fun. Um, but that was really the first um, scooter to launch that really took off a lot of things. And then Lime and Bird came in 2018. And so again, if you think about it, you know, since Xiaomi, it's been six, seven years that the category has only oh. been started. Um, and we started in 2019, right? So, so very quickly after that. Um, and with that comes, and you'd be surprised, I mean, when we went to China in 2019, we went to all the factories, there was no assembly um, lines, there was no quality control, it was yeah. a joke. Uh, and that's when you realize, okay, electric bikes and everything are miles ahead. Um, so, so that's where we are in terms of um, the scooters. So in terms of the landscape itself, um, it's really important to understand it's a new market and then pricing, it's gonna take a bit of time. So people, majority of people are trying the Lime and the Bird scooters um, and that's their first ever time touching a scooter. Mm. And then they realize, oh, this is really practical, but I'm paying $10 per trip. And it costs a lot. Why not just buy an entry level electric scooter? They went on Amazon, they go to Fnac, Adati, or any mass, uh, mass store, and they buy a scooter for $200. So that's where it gets really interesting as well. So, you know, in terms of even the price points of scooters and, and how they've ranked up, in 2019, on average, it was $426 a scooter. Um, that's, that's US dollars. That's US dollars, but it's also US aggregates and Europe aggregate together. I see. If you go into Euro Europe, it's much cheaper. It's around okay. like $250, $300. Wow, really? Yeah. Uh, and that's simply because Xiaomi flooded the markets mm. in 2018, 2019. Um, dealers were getting 2% margins. It was very like, it was all about the brand presence mm, and awareness. Um, so anyway, it was really interesting. And now you see very quickly to 2023, the average price is around 550. So you've seen a 20, 30% growth um, in average retail price of scooters. And what do you think that is? I really think it's because people are replacing their cars with scooters. They understand scooters are not kids' toys anymore, right? So, I mean, they have suspension, they mm. have, um, great speed, great range. Like a scooter can go up to 80 kilometers. That's a lot, right? right? Um, and that's why I guess that's exactly the sector we're in and that's what we're focusing on. We're not your first scooter. We're your second scooter. You're gonna buy a go track. You're, so you're gonna buy a, <laughs> your first and last, your yeah, middle and last. Um, but really, like, I think that's the biggest thing. So they, they, people always ask us, you know, do you like Lime and Bird? It must tarnish your reputation, etc. But we love Lime and Bird because mm -hmm. it's essentially free test drives and it's converting people into our category. Yeah. Um, so overall, I think, again, seeing that rise in price simply means um, that people are switching more to higher powered electric scooters, mm. which is great. And what, even in the marketing side, how many percents of people are saying they replace their cars again with scooters? 70 to 80, yeah. Yeah, which is huge, right? It's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and you never believe that until you have a scooter. Like, I use my scooter everywhere now, and I, you know, I use my car much, much less. Um, but essentially, that's really important mm. to understand, like, the rise of that, um, that category. So. Where you know, our entry level scooter is still eight ninety nine nine ninety nine, yeah. like Palo Air. Um, so we're still a bit far away from that mass, but it's coming towards that, which is mm. a really good, uh, a really good opportunity for us. So, so that obviously begs the question: if you, if you know, if you've seen that 20, 30 percent increase in average scooter prices over the last three years, 
do you anticipate this will continue to be the case? And, and if so, where do you think we're going to see a bit of a ceiling? Because obviously you yeah. can't go on forever. For sure. And I think that's always going to be a bit of a gap between that entry level and then sort of a bit more the luxury uh -huh. tier. Um, and it's very important to understand where we play in, right, as a polo. I think, you know, we can't compete against the four or $500 scooters, Segways, uh, all these huge companies, because they're essentially just flooding the market and decreasing their price as quickly as possible. And that's how you destroy a brand overall. I, well, that's my opinion, of course. Um, but overall, I think we are staying at that sort of higher price point mm -hmm. um, because we have such great scooters and you do have suspension and comfort, et cetera. Um, and overall, I see, I do see that price going up. I think, again, there's going to be, it's probably going to plateau at around six, $700 mm -hmm. mass. And then, you know, people who are purchasing that will then come and buy a higher powered scooter. Like, right. it's like iPhones, it's like everything else. Once you sort of see the technology and the ability of touching something that has uh -huh. all these really high premium specs, you can't go back afterwards. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, we, we, we have this conversation internally quite a lot about how back in the early days of, of cell phones, there was that race. Um, well, there were two races. There was the race to uh, see who's got a bigger um, display, right? Those displays just kept getting bigger and bigger year after camera, year. Yeah. You basically got to like iPad sized phones at one yeah. point. And then the other one was the camera, right? It started with like six megapixels and then eight and then 12. And then eventually at some point it was like over a hundred. Yeah. And now and now we've sort of backtracked to like regular sized phones and like what usually between 12 and probably yeah. 40 megapixels, depending on how pro you want to go with your photography. Exactly. Um, so we've sort of pulled back and we realized actually a lot of the uh, quality of that experience comes from software and the uh, operating system that, that the hardware is, is enabled to, yeah. right? So um, so are you seeing similar trends to that in, in scooters as well, where maybe we're kind of no longer playing with the 100 miles per hour scooters and we're sort of going yeah. back and maybe saying, okay, hold on, we know on average people are riding, you know, this scooter this fast and for this far, yeah. maybe we don't need to go um, as, as extreme as we used to. For sure. And I think that's really a, a very good point because and that's also very, that's how you can tell how developed the market is versus another market. In the US, we're seeing a huge switch and a transition from the consumer mindset to features versus mm -hmm. specs. Like nobody cares if you have a 500 or 700 watt motor anymore. It's more about, okay, I live in Vancouver. Um, I need to get up this hill, which is a 10 link line. Can I get up over your scooter? Right. It's going to be like a lot of rain is IP66. Great. And that's it. Like at the end of the day, whether you're going 45 or 55, 60 kilometers an hour, it doesn't matter anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And with regulation, it's going to come. But you compare that to the French market. The French market is incredibly still very price sensitive. And you see on all the Reddit forums and everything there, they're comparing the wattage per price on every scooter. So, you know, they're going to buy a scooter. They're going to say, okay, this is 500 watts for 200 euros, 2.2. Right. You know, they start complete. And that's, we saw that probably two years ago, right? Yeah. And now you've seen that market shift, which is fantastic. Um, and that's why I think that's where it's going to come to in the end for us. Um, and it's the same thing. Like, I think it also comes to how people are purchasing their products as well. We're not there yet, but like your iPhone, do you know how much your iPhone actually costs? MSRP? Probably thousand dollars. That's that. it. Yeah. We, we don't even remember how much it costs yeah. anymore because we're paying on a monthly basis, right? You're, mm -hmm. Everyone's financing their products, um, which is really, really important. And that's what we're doing much more on the marketing side. You've got a homepage, it's, I don't know what the scooter costs, but I'm paying $50 a month for yeah. 12 months. It's great. Okay, perfect. So you're starting to change that language and we're seeing the customer behavior go that way. Um, and it's really just important to understand which markets are doing it and how you can adapt to them. Mm. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, that's super, super interesting. And I think uh, to your point, um, people are starting to change their mindset to realizing that, um, you know, to your point, initially the benchmark for scooter pricing was what? It was uh, probably kick scooters, right? Yeah. Like children's kick scooters. So when you okay. come out and you say it's going to be four hundred dollars, I remember the early day reactions we used to get were like, "What? Like, yeah. are you kidding me? Five hundred bucks for a scooter? That's insane, right?" Yeah. And now we're to your point, maturing as a category. People are saying, "Okay, a thousand bucks is a little bit expensive, but I'm getting X, Y, and Z, and it's going to last for two years, and it comes with a ten thousand kilometer yeah. warranty." And and you're starting to see the mindset um, justify the expense, right? Because yeah. you're you're starting to understand, okay, this is going to last me for X amount of months. I'm going to be able to put this many kilometers on it. And now you're comparing it maybe to a bike, right? Yeah. And to your point, I think we in particular as Apollo have carved out a niche and more of this vehicle grade territory where our scooters are more often than not compared to taking the bus or yeah. taking the tram or taking the metro and maybe in some cases taking the car. Yeah. Um, and so when you get into that territory, I mean, the, the savings and the benefits of scooters almost increase exponentially, yeah. right? So exactly. And then you compare that to electric bikes, like electric bikes start at three, four thousand dollars unless you're going That's to it, a yeah. cheaper entry level. Um, and then, yeah, then it's a no brainer type of thing. And then you look at a car and you're looking at insurance, parking, and then that, especially during these tough economic times, right? Yeah. This year, you've seen a huge shift of people trying to find alternatives to public transit and, and cars. So yeah, I think the landscape's changing a lot, which is very exciting. 
and it's it's coming like the whole market's moving towards our products and where we are as a business okay. which is why i think you know it's going to come in a year or two but we're ready we're ready to conquer that when it comes we're going to be yeah awesome okay so so before we before we talk about the future and, and, and conquering the world um <laughs> can you give us a quick recap of just what happened in terms of in terms of distribution at Apollo. What what is the history of, of wholesale? Sure. So I mean for those who don't really know the history of Apollo, we started in twenty nineteen. Uh, it was mostly OEMs um, while growing that Apollo brand for 2019-2020 and then twenty twenty one we released our first design scooter which was Apollo Phantom. And then since then we've been we've been phasing out our OEMs. Um, so in twenty nineteen we had our first dealer in the US um, and that was just like you know an interesting way of you know, of selling it to them. Um, and growing a little bit more distribution. We had nothing really unique. The biggest uniqueness and the reason why they were working with us was they didn't want to work with China directly. Mm. You know, it's complicated. There's a lot of, you know, back and forth with parts and it's just a mess. I'd rather work with someone uh, locally. So that was 2019. Um, and then 2020, sorry, 2021, um, there was a lot of US small retailers asking for stock and all. And, you know, we were like keen, we were super passionate. We were like, oh yes, yes, yes. And we we're starting to sell, sell, sell. But what we realized very quickly is that Again, you're selling to a lot of people who don't have the right infrastructure, mm -hmm. which is really dangerous because they can sell it to a customer, then the customer goes to them to get it repaired. They have no idea how to repair it, then they come to us. We don't have the information of the customer and it just, it's not a good process overall. Um, so that was a really important learning that we did quite quickly. Um, and then 2022, again, we had a lot of dealers in Europe and everywhere else. Uh, and I think we did that a little bit too fast. Um, too quickly as well mm. uh, without doing a proper due diligence on those dealers to see you know what is the long term how are they treating the customers etc so 2023 has been a huge change um, we've cut down a lot of our distribution partners we have around 15 now and it's really like one per territory for many reasons one is uh, you make sure they have the right infrastructure and I'll get into that a little bit afterwards um, the right infrastructure they take care of the customers properly um, but most importantly is is really that they, I mean, they have the potential to grow and take care of the customers as well as we would. Um, mm. So it's more about, again, quality over quantity, and that leads to quantity in the long run. Mm. Um, because we've seen so many distribution partners and so many brands, like the Zero Scooters and all, who are not here anymore. The reason mm. is they were selling to every single person possible. There was no price control. It deteriorated the brand, and there was no support for dealers. Mm. So they never had spare parts. And that's exactly what we must not do. Um, and that's why we're taking it a bit slow. Even, you know, it's very, very tempting to say yes to everybody and like, here you go but it's going to kill your brand overall in the long term. Mm. That's super yeah. interesting, especially, you know, um, with the recent collapse of Van Moof as mm -hmm. well, right? Who um, made some very bold choices, I think, both in terms of products, but uh, also in terms of distribution, right? They famously uh, cut all of their distributors and they wanted to control distribution entirely yeah. by themselves. And um, I think what we are seeing as well is it's very difficult to have a retail presence mm -hmm. uh, when you're only selling one type of product, right? Like, that's why it's so rare to see one brand with like three or four SKUs go into retail, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just, there's just not enough volume there, yeah. right? Hence the whole rise of uh, kind of diversified distributors where maybe you have some e-bikes, you have some e-scooters, you have some, uh, you know, hoverboards, whatever. That sort of sustains itself as a, as a business model. And um, uh, I'm curious, you know, did, did you ever think about Apollo getting into retail um, from, from that yeah. point of view too? So, so what, I mean, at Apollo, what we do a lot is like test and learn. Uh, we'll do a lot of different things and if it's a good idea, why not try it? And so in 2021, um, we launched two pop-up stores for a period of three, four months and one in Toronto in downtown Toronto and one in Vancouver. Um, and what we learned very quickly of all is, you know, the summer went fantastically. We had 1,500 test drives in total. Um, but what we were seeing was the amount of resources it took to maintain and keep those stores open mm. for three months was was really really just it was too much compared to what you know we could be investing on the websites and on on ads and just more content etc overall yeah. um and we would see different things like the store was empty from monday to friday completely and then friday to i mean friday to sunday was packed like fully booked and this is that waste of those four or five days yeah. um just still paying rent still paying salaries right exactly yeah. exactly so I definitely think retail will come for us at a certain point, mm -hmm. whether it's a you know brand experience store or it's actually a retail store. Um, it's just by now we have so many low hanging fruits in terms of right. great dealers, even Best Buy having it there in you know sort of physical locations. Um, I think that's the first step. And as we get to like more product ranges of a wider variety and a bigger brand, retail will make sense. But uh, it was just too costly overall. Mm -hmm. yeah. Understood. And uh, I mean, uh, along the same lines in terms of just other kind of parallel business models that maybe exist, did you ever look at some sort of a B2B partnership or maybe it's not 
selling to somebody who's selling to the end consumer, but perhaps, you know, a partnership with a hotel or yeah. anything like that. Any, any interest from those types of yeah. customers? So, so that's also very interesting. Um, I, I love it. I think there's so much potential on it. I just don't think the product is right yet, mm. um, which is really important. Like we, we do sell a lot to a lot of rental fleets and companies that use our scooters for, you know, rental day rentals, et cetera. And that's fine. Um, but we, what we really want to do is, I guess, in the future, sort of have, you have to have a full system and it's a whole different business model doing a B2B direct model. Um, if you're doing it with a hotel, for example, all of them need to be connected through IoT. Right. The IoT needs to be managed perfectly. There has to be a whole team doing that. And these companies, what they want is essentially, they want a very operational um, solution, meaning they rent the scooters, you take care of the servicing, delivery, everything else, um, and then they get the scooters back whenever they want which we are not an operationally, we're not an operation company. You know I mean? I, yes, we have our repair centers of, and, and things like that, but it's a whole different ball game. Right. It's, it's, like, purpose, yeah. it's like getting into a fleet market right. and we're not in a fleet operations yet. Um, but again, I think that will come at a certain point and there's some really cool products that L1 and the team are, are working on for that. I just don't think it's, it's, um, it's a time yet. Yeah. Mm, gotcha. Okay. So for now, the focus is very much, let's make up all scooters available where customers shop pretty exactly. much. Um, and I think to your point, um, you, you shared some really interesting statistics last year about the percentage of shoppers that buy scooters uh, kind of from online uh, direct players versus what percentage comes from from retail. Can you just kind of rehash those stats? Yeah, so I mean, our market specifically, it's around 80% will buy in retail. 80% 80 in retail, in retail in versus 20% online. And that's what we try to do as much as possible is like build that confidence um, through YouTube reviews and through everything so people can buy it. But at the end of the day, there's still a majority of people who want to touch, feel the product. So. I think that's that's of, of the step we're doing now, which is growth through synergies, I guess, uh, and partnerships. So, for example, like I mentioned uh, on this week at Aprota, we're going through Best Buy because Best Buy has an incredible amount of doors. Um, they have a good service overall, uh, and it's just an easy way for like getting retail presence with a brand that yeah. sort of aligns with our values. Yeah. Instead of us, like, how long would it take, and how much money would it take to open up two hundred stores tomorrow in the US? Yes, right. Yeah. It makes no sense. So, growth through that is always a testing system as well. So we test that. If it goes better, we get more space, we open up more test drives, etc. Um, and I think that's a huge portion of it. Like right now we need to debunk, um, we need to make people comfortable with scooters um, to be able to purchase it online without yeah. having to test drive it, which takes it. Yeah. Well, I remember, uh, I forget who, who mentioned this, but it was uh, some crazy stat about what number of people visit Walmarts in the US on an annual basis. And it was like a third of the yeah. population goes yeah. into Best Buy or something like that, or into Walmart, sorry. Yeah. And so a big part of their pitch to to brands um, that are looking for shelf space is the amount of visibility you're going to get from just being at Walmart yeah. is greater than any other move you could you could make, really, yeah. right? So I think Best Buy is obviously that on a smaller scale, but it, yeah. you know, inadvertently, it's still going to result in greater visibility and, and awareness of the brand. For sure. Um, so, so what else are you thinking about in, in that space? You know, because obviously that's that's a great first step, and, and everyone's really excited, and we hope it works out. Yeah. If it does work out, well, how do you see that evolve? Yeah, I think I mean it's a, if you look at the five year plan overall, I think Best Buy is is ready for scooters now, which is great. As we go forward, Best Buy opening up geek squad and repair and servicing centers that's going to be huge because mm -hmm. that's like a full 360 package um, and then it's opening up to even more locations right and that's where you start getting into conversations with the walmarts and the costcos um and different things like that like we have i think we have a great b2c infrastructure we have repair centers and, and partners that we work with but how do you get it even more and how do you make it like in every single city or every single region right. there's a full support system um today walmart doesn't make sense in any way mm -hmm. because it's very, very cheap entry level uh, scooters. They don't have a support system and it can tarnish your brand quite badly. They'll get there in two, three years. Um, I but again, I think, I think Best Buy is probably one of the best partners to do it for now and even in the long term. It's just because that allows us to grow and have the locations that we didn't need. Um, that we wouldn't actually do ourselves. Yeah. So that's a big one on, on, on that. Europe is another big one, which I won't get into too much because that's much, it's still much more complex. But as well, I think the other avenue is the B2B. Like mm. we get so many requests on the B2B, whether it's golf courses, hotels, um, rental fleets with condos, like, and we're in conversations with all these partners. Yeah. It's just, again, we're waiting for the product and we don't want to, we don't want to bite off more than we can chew, right? We want to just really go step by step. Uh, and I think Best Buy is going to be the perfect way to do that. That's great. And um, I know one of the viewers of this podcast is going to comment um, asking when are Apollo scooters going to come to Europe? So yeah. Is there a way to get an Apollo scooter if I live in Switzerland, Spain, Germany today? Yeah, so we have we have distributors in the UK, which are Wide and Glide. We have them in um, Switzerland. 
Spain, Iceland, um, Austria, like all these, it's all on our websites, um, but there's more and more players going and, and these distributors also ship to other countries. Mm. So if there isn't a distributor in your, in your country, go on Wine and Glide and you'll see you can, you can ship it to your country. The only thing is a service network, which we're working on. Um, and Europe is very, very complex just in terms of the borders. And once you go over the border, you have to pay tax and it gets, it gets a bit messy. Yeah. Um, it will definitely come. And we are talking to a few big dealers in, in France, etc. Um, I'll mention that more later, but that's, that's a big, the big part of it. So if you're in Europe, visit, look at our website, you'll see it. Um, and we are working on getting better dealers, uh, more dealers, sorry, uh, in more locations. Um, cause again, at the end of the day, we just want to make sure, you know, you can get the product every single place you're located. Mm -hmm. And it's always, it always hurts me whenever you see a YouTube video and someone's like, oh, it's not available in my country. I'm like, okay, right. I'm going to make it a challenge to make it available in your country. Right. Um, but right now we're just really prioritizing that, you know, the U S Canada, Europe, Saudi, and then, and then we'll see where it goes in the future. And I think, uh, you know, to your point, um, this idea of sustainable growth is, is so key, right? Like we, we exploded as a brand in the first two years of inception. I mean, it was, it was just like absolutely uncontrollable, yeah. um, often painful growth that lent itself to poor customer experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and at one point it got so out of control, it was very difficult to rein it back in, right? So I think we, we kind of learned from that experience and now we're very much choosing our steps uh, carefully and kind mm -hmm. of thinking about, okay, well, before we expand to, let's say Germany, what, what will the support infrastructure look like, right? What kind of partners do we need to, what is the legal environment like? So I think we're just much more considerate in terms of how we approach distribution overall. And, um, yeah. and it's, it's great to see because that will only result in better customer experiences at the end of the yeah. day, right? And exactly. And, and the nice thing is that we have more and more access to data and how, like even our dashboard internally, where we can see all how people are using their scooters. Yeah. Um, what's really important is understanding which markets are ready and which ones are not. And, and the reality is we sell a luxury product. So it might not make sense to go into Germany where there's much more restrictions and the max yeah. speed is 25 times an hour, 20 times an hour. Um, so I know a lot of people sort of see, oh, why is the problem not here? Why not here? It's like, that it will come at a certain point. It's like, we are just looking at all the information and what makes sense for the brand. Yeah. Because of limited resources as well at the end of the day. But um, I think again, like this, I mean, where we are today is fantastic and it's growing at a very healthy rate. Um, and next year, I think it's going to be a lot more really cool um, announcements, but for now, it's like just ensuring that we have the right infrastructure, the right quality, make sure customers are taken care of fantastically as we grow the distribution for us. Yeah. Cool. All right. That's it. That's super exciting. So you kind of alluded to some some big segments, uh, exciting announcements next year. Uh, can you just speak a little bit about what's next for for wholesale? So you you kind of you know gave us the lay of the land where in Canada and in the U.S. we're distributing directly. We're looking for some offline physical support, which I think is, is going to be important. Um, is Best Buy Canada on the table at all? Yeah, so we're in talks okay. with Best Buy Canada um, for next year. Um, they have a great team here as well in Canada. Uh, the only harder thing with Canada is that the, the seasonality, right? Right. You know, it snows, or it, you know, it's very cold temperatures for six months. Uh, but definitely, I think we're based in Canada and we love Canada. I think uh, it's just a matter of time. There's, there's small things as well, which are like, um, US has a return uh, restocking fee policy. And again, the reason I say this is because many people are impulse purchases, they'll buy something without really considering it and then return it after using it. And that causes enormous amounts of environmental waste and like it just it creates a lot of complexities. Yeah. Um, as you've seen on Amazon getting scrutiny for that as well. Um, so US has a 15% restocking fee, Amazon, uh, sorry, Best Buy Canada, we're waiting for that as well. Um, and that's really important because it allows the customer to just have a bit more of a tank. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to make sure what's healthy for us as well. Um, but Best Buy Canada will be coming uh, soon for sure. But gotcha. yeah. So, so it sounds like it's a little bit less about, you know, sort of forcing no returns as much as it is just about deterring people who are perhaps not thinking they're purchased through fully. Exactly. And again, it's like, you know, there's things happen and whatever, but it's, it's really making sure that you've thought about the purchase before you do it. And yeah. it's, just, it, it, it's more the environmental side, I think is important. Um, but yeah, again, we still, we stand by a product super solid. I think it's, uh, it's going to come. So Best Buy Canada is one of them. Europe has again, a few key players that are, I'm really, really excited to talk about, but I won't share anything yet. Yeah. Um, and then it's B2B. I think B2B with the new products that we're getting, uh, that's going to be really exciting, just growing that whole different mm -hmm. business model on that side as well. Yeah, it really feels like our moment has finally come in terms of product, you know, like yeah. we've been we've been talking about being in a place where we have the right product to build our distribution on for so long. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it really feels like uh, that the moment has finally yeah. come, which is which is great. And that's it. I mean, the, what the team's been working on the product side is incredible. Like. The product hardware is unbelievable. The assembly kits, like the way we do it, you know, there's a hundred moving parts on the scooter. Today we have 24 assembly kits that customers can do it themselves. 
um, which makes the whole repair system so much easier. We have a self-diagnosis dashboard that allows retailers to see their scooters without even having a scooter in front of them, right? They go on the back, uh, back end and they can see it. So that, you know, the whole um, R&D team has been working so hard on that, which is fantastic. Even the brand, the marketing team has been doing really, really well on that. And that really makes a huge bump uh, internationally. And now it's just, you know, I'm, my goal is just to make sure it's available everywhere else. So once you have the best product and the marketing, the rest is easy. Yeah, rest is easy. easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, so Chris, you know, just before we, we wrap it up, um, any thoughts on the future of, of wholesale? I mean, I know you already explained the next steps in distribution. You, you explained the next geographic regions we want to expand to. Um, are there any more kind of big picture ideas you're, you're thinking about in terms of distribution and, and the future of Polo? I mean, I try to think of the next two years and I think it's really, it's going to be a very segmented game. It's like, so when you want to recruit, um, what sort of SKUs are available at which different, you know, phase of the consumer's journey. So if you never seen a scooter before, you go on Amazon, the entry level SKU type of product is going to be that. We're not going to have a high powered scooter on, on Amazon, for example. And you go into Best Buy, you'll have the mid entry to mid the level tier. Mm -hmm. Now what we're doing, and we're working with a lot of different partners on the B2B front to incorporate scooters into different um, aspects of a business. So rental car fleets, for example, someone's going to drop off a car um, at, at your place, they need to get home. Instead of walking two kilometers, there's a car and the, there's a scooter in there. In there um, in a, in a trunk. Um, it goes the same with the yachting industry, the RV industry, the golf industry. Like I can talk about this for hours and I'm so like, I'm so excited about it, but I just, I can't think about it because mm -hmm. it's, it's going to take too much time, resources yeah. to develop and everything else. And it's coming, but it's just, there's so many low hanging fruits. Um, so right now it's again, distribution priority to make sure it's available. And then it's going to be growth through partnerships and businesses, um, which I think our products are not there yet. They're getting there very quickly. Um, but just like small things like swappable batteries and just making a bit more of a better infrastructure for B2B is going to be mm -hmm. the next big one. And I think that's going to probably be, probably 2025 is going to be the big year for B2B. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So 2024 is kind of the big box retail expansion. Let's make yeah. our models available um, same day or even, you know, you want to learn about it this morning, you want to pick it up this afternoon, great, go exactly. see what it looks like. And then the year after that is perhaps more of the experience based approach where yeah. you're staying at a hotel or going to a golf course and you get to try it out. Exactly. And it, it's, it, and it's, it's very complimentary in a way that everything we set up next year in 2024 is really going to be, um, it's like, okay, you have all your physical distributions, which are also service centers. And then in 2025, when you have the B2B, the B2B can actually, well, the service centers can actually repair for B2B, right? So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you're, you're creating all these networks and that's your base funnel. And then you're making, you know, more and more distribution, more service available to customers. So it's all going to flow together. Um, it's just a matter of prioritization for now, which Again, I really think we're on the right track um, and it's just, yeah, it's exciting, but you can't think about that too much right now. Yeah. It's just planting the seeds and then slowly growing as you, as you go forward. Beautiful. That's super exciting. Any uh, final parting thoughts uh, you wanted to share? No, I think that's pretty much it. Um, again, we're always looking for great partners and, and even service repair centers and, and everything else. So if, if you guys are interested, whoever's watching this, please leave a comment below or sign up on the website. Um, and yeah, I mean, any other feedback on, on distribution or um, anything we're always open to it but uh, super exciting um, again I think we're, we're just scraping the surface and we're in the right direction with product marketing brand and it's going to be really cool next two years beautiful all right Chris well thank cool. you so much for coming on the show and uh, <laughs> giving us a bit of an insight into your into your world of course thanks for having me guys